Well, hello, folks. Uh, my name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be hosting today on the Law and Crime Network for this trial as well as the uh, Crate trial, which we'll be getting to uh, in, I guess, a little bit later. Uh, this is These are two really great trials. Law and Crime always does a great job. I have with me uh, Linda Kenny Bodden, who was my previous guest when I was hosting, and she's great to have on the show. Welcome, Linda. Appreciate Thank you, you being here. Thank you, Bob. Nice to be back. Absolutely. So it's always great to have Linda here because you're a real uh, star trial attorney, and we get into real nuances here. So let's look at this case a little bit and break it down, uh, Linda. One, I've asked all people, by the way, who are watching this uh, to ask questions, and we're going to try to capture those questions. We can't answer all of them, but I've already got a couple. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier. So when you're preparing a case like this, Linda, uh, and you see it coming together and you're evaluating the evidence as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, we in our world call cases a win or a not win uh, differently than probably the public does or even the jury does. What do you see as a win or a not win from the lawyer's perspective that is the prosecution and the defense in this case? If the defendant here, the high school football player, the sweetheart, if you want to call him that since he killed his sweetheart, uh, gets convicted of manslaughter or even aggravated manslaughter, that is a win because it's not the top count. Remember, defense attorneys want the win. They don't necessarily want the top count, Bob. They want the win for a lesser count. They're not necessarily looking for a not guilty count, even when you, you plead to something. So that would be a win in this case for the defense. Well, one of our uh, people that called in here, and I hope I have it right, is... Uh I think it's HJ1 Mad City asks, why not a plea? But interesting, we learned something in this case, and it's very different than we practice in New Jersey, and I believe New York as right. well, that the defendant actually pled guilty to some of the charges in the indictment. Mm -hmm. One of the powers I had as the county prosecutor, or even when I was an assistant prosecutor, was to say to the defense attorney, if you want to plead to the indictment, the entire indictment, which would include the murder charges, yes. knock yourself out, because there's all sorts of mandatory sentencing. But apparently here in this state, you're allowed to cherry pick what you'll plead guilty to and what you won't. What do you think about what he pled guilty to, and was that a good strategic move for the defense? Sure, it's, it's a great strategic move. I've been to Tennessee. I actually had to do the jury selection in Tennessee uh, with jury questionnaires some years back on, on a, what, what had been a death penalty case. And, and absolutely, because once you take that responsibility, that helps you in front of a jury. Right, and, and I think from the beginning of this case, before we saw openings today, when I was reviewing it, preparing for today's, uh, you know, uh, right. discussion with you. Because uh, you were scared of me, I know. Well, no, no, you're, you're the, I always love working with a pro, so it's never a problem, nothing to be scared of with that. But here's the thing. It is clear that they were going to be able to prove that he is the person, in my opinion, that fired the weapon. Right. And sometimes you need to give up the ghost a little bit. And what a lot of people don't get is that they think that lawyers are always working with technicalities and things of that nature. But when you're in front of the jury, you're talking about the real world mm -hmm. here. And if you try to bite off more than you can chew, it can bite you back. And, and what he can say in closing, he can say, look, we took responsibility for what we did. We, we said we, we, we were guilty, but we're not going to take responsibility for what we didn't do. And you I kind of saw that a little bit in the opening statement. Yeah, and I think that that was a great strategic move by the defense in the case. That's all they have. Yeah, but because, listen, if you can prove he shot and fired the weapon into the room, right. that is clearly under the law by any state's definition going to be considered a reckless act. That is one where you may not have intended death to occur, but it was reasonably certain that death could occur with as a, a result of with a loaded sure. weapon. Right. But in this case, very interestingly, and I was thinking about this when I was coming in today, we have a girl who was sleeping on a bed. We we only have two rounds fired, and I was really curious to listen to the prosecution's cases, how they were going to prove that this is beyond reckless, that is, that this was intentional, or that it was knowing, or that the goal of the defendant when he fired those rounds was to actually kill her when it appears he wasn't even able to see her. So it's a pretty, I, I didn't hear the prosecution well, really address that. Except that if he knew where she was sleeping in that bed, he knew where that bed was, he knew where her head was going to be, then you could argue as a prosecution that that's really planned because he shot right where he knew her head was going to be. That's the other side of this token, okay? Right. So, and that may be good for the prosecution. We haven't heard that evidence yet, but I expect to hear something about that. Yeah, well, you know, listen, let's get back to that prosecution's case. I agree that that's where they're going to have to go with it. And it gets to the question that I had just uh, had enunciated here with right. uh, Mr. Mad City, um, is why not, a, yeah, I love it. Why not a plea? Well, that's a great question because a lot of times the defense may say, listen, we were 
willing to plead to reckless. We pled to right. it, in fact, in the indictment. But we weren't willing to plead to anything that dealt with knowing or intentional homicide. So from the defense standpoint, they may be saying, this is snow and winter. We'll plead guilty to what we know we're going to get convicted of and take a shot that we won't be convicted of the higher charges. And, and we don't know what the plea offer was. I mean, it could have been that you plead, you have to plead guilty to the whole indictment and there's no lesser penalty that we're going to give you, the prosecution says to the defense. So we don't know those negotiations. And if that's the case, then the defense has to try the case. Right. And I'll, I'll flip that on the side of being a homicide prosecutor myself and then having led an agency. I could hear myself very clearly saying to one of my assistant prosecutors in a case like this, like, yeah, you may have a tough case here with two rounds fired through a window proving whether or not that was actually murder or just reckless. But I'd rather you try the case and lose it than give it away by an anemic plea offer to but reckless you, But conduct. you see, here's the problem with that. Once these cases become in the media and they become a higher profile case, which now this is because it's a media attention case, that's what happens. It's better to let the jury take the rap if it's going to be a lesser included or not guilty than the agency take the rap. And you probably didn't do that. But I, I, I have been in my career, I've seen that happen where they say, look, we're going to, you know, we're going to let the chips fall where they may, you know, and uh, we're going to try this case. Yeah, you know, but I, I've always led, you know, you go before the public, the court of public opinion, and you start allowing the court of public opinion to drive your decisions, the tail starts to wag the dog, and you can look just as uh, silly at the end when you lose the case. I, I personally just think that the prosecution thinks that it's got a little bit of a difficult case here as far as proving intentional uh, homicide. And we're going to get to something that another uh, person asked on the blog, okay. which is a really insightful question. Uh, but I, I really do believe there, I think, like I would say, go in and fight the fight. If you lose and you put on a good case, you hold your head up high, you walk out the door. 99% of the time, we didn't lose those cases. But there's a little mm -hmm. thing here the prosecution's got, Linda. There's a little trick a little, there's a little like a little uh, thing here in the law that gives the prosecution incredible power and it's called the felony murder yes. charge yes can you explain and and uh, let's see who was this this was if I got it if, I apologize if I got it wrong BB 314 asked what is the difference between murder and felony murder and it very well may explain why the prosecution chose to go forward with the case absolutely in an intentional murder case you have to prove an intent I intended to kill this particular person or another person and the intent got transferred. But this particular person is the stronger case. But in a felony murder, you have to prove that there's an underlying crime such as aggravated assault. We saw that in the Tex MacGyver case. Mm -hmm. And if that gets proven and somebody dies in the process of a felony, another felony, then that becomes a felony murder. And it's much easier for the prosecution to get a conviction on that than it is under an intentional murder. Right. Listen, I, I love as a prosecutor having that felony murder because a lot of times it was a who is the person who actually did it who is the person who actually pulled the trigger right you may have three or four defendants but if you can get them under a predicate felony they call it. it's not just any felony right it's felonies listed in each state that if during the commission of that felony even if you did not intend that a person die you are as responsible as the person who actually committed the actual homicide and stuff like That's robbery right. would be a perfect example well, but it was mostly for the third party it was like the car driver in the bank robbery is the class example and somebody in the bank gets killed that car driver is as equally guilty for the murder as somebody who pulled the trigger but now it's been taken by prosecutors who are very smart that if you have that underlying predicate felony that's specified in a statute you too just go to the felon right directly to the felony murder. right and we're gonna go to one more uh, blog question before we throw back to a clip of the actual opening statements that we think were really relevant and then afterwards we're going to come back and discuss okay. those pieces but uh, I, I agree with you with regard to everything you said about felony murder obviously powerful tool yes. for the prosecution but you know, a lot of people around the country are starting to become very concerned about what they believe is prosecutorial abuse with the felony murder right. rule right. it used to be for those who were involved in a plan they knew that there were weapons right. being used they yes, knew there was right. this possibility and, and, and a lot of times people are not being convicted of intentional murder but going to jail for as long as that for having very minor involvement in this particular case let's talk about it because mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, Dana uh, day Anna rather 421 that wanted to know what what is the predicate felony she knew the predicate felony was child abuse uh, in amazing? this case amazing you, sure this is really unusual I've never heard of a child abuse predicate felony in a felony murder case right. where there wasn't an actual uh, custodial parent role right. or a teacher role or something where there was more of an adult child relationship so we kind of were kibitzing back and forth about that and I do believe it in fact applies although it's the first time I've ever seen prosecutors use it in this 
this fashion. What are your thoughts? Well, well I've seen it because I've had another case in Tennessee, a different, another case, where that if you have a child abuse and that child dies, that that becomes a felony murder. And it's to protect children. Think about, think about the most helpless child. There'll be a baby who gets battered and beaten in the process of, of the battering and beaten, which is also child abuse and also assault. That baby dies. That becomes a felony murder, even though there was no intention for the person doing that battering and beating to have the child die. So it's perfectly understandable, reasonable, but it's interesting now it's being applied to a 16-year-old girl who's killed by her boyfriend. I haven't seen that done before. Yeah, I agree completely. It is definitely a twist on a theme. I'm going to read the statute as I see it on my computer uh, from Tennessee. It says, any person who knowingly abuses or neglects a child under 18 years of age so as to adversely affect the child's health and welfare commits and uh, right. commits the crime. So that's a, a for a day and a 421. Great question. Right. That is the child abuse predicate it's, felony it's here. It's knowingly, interestingly enough, he pled guilty yesterday to uh, shooting into a house that was occupied. You know, the classic, you're going to endanger somebody. But then the child abuse statute is knowing. It's not right. reckless. So it'll be interesting. They're going to have to prove some intent that he knowingly intended to abuse her when he did those shots, as opposed to he recklessly shot her. So it becomes another interesting twist. Yeah, and I think the prosecution is going to argue here to your point and I know that a lot of people could get a phase over with regard to listening to I these know. strict legal things but the fact what? of the matter is they're extremely important right. because that's what the jury is going to be told at the end of the case and my experience has been generally speaking jurors listen to the instructions very intently that the judge give them despite the fact that half the time the lawyers can't even figure out what the jury instructions are saying but this one is crystal clear it's a, a person who's 18 years old she's 16 and you are right it requires knowing conduct but I'm gonna bet that the the prosecutor is going to argue the knowing conduct was merely firing the rounds That's into the bedroom, argue. irrespective of whether or not he thought they were going to hit her or not. Going to argue. And the defense attorney is going to say, look, that's not the knowing conduct, because knowing conduct, sure, he knowingly shot the gun, but he didn't intend to hurt her. He intended to scare her, and that's not child abuse. But is it? Right. Well, I, I think it's going to get close. When you start firing weapons into a 16-year-old's bedroom, uh, when to she's sleeping, bedroom. yeah, uh, right. Sp right. Of course, mm -hmm. I think you're going to have a pretty good argument that you violated the child abuse law, right. although we've never seen it done this way before. So, getting back to the point, Linda, I believe that this is the reason the prosecution said, "Let's try this case," because at a minimum, we think we got a pretty solid felony murder case. Even though you know, deep down in their hearts, they want to prove intentional, intentional murder, murder here. You're right. You're right? absolutely right. But you know what? For the defense to get anything less than intentional murder is a win for the defense. Yeah. It's still a win for the defense because there may be a little lessening of how much time he spends in jail because he's very young. He's well, let, let's check that out when we're on break because just to use it New Jersey, be, uh, right. for example, the felony murder charge carries the same penalties as, as the in intentional murder itself. And that's what makes it a powerful tool. I'm not sure about that in Tennessee. Right, I agree with you. I don't know. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Linda Kenny Bodden is here with us. And uh, as you can see, she's uh, amazing yeah. in terms of her ability to be able to uh, break down the case. That's why I love dancing with her on, <laughs> on set with these cases. And for all you guys who have uh, put out there these questions they were really insightful right from the very beginning I'm sure there's a lot more hopefully we can get to them but let's go back to the opening statements here in the case of the prosecution as they're also teeing up some of the background and we're gonna get into I know we want to talk about the first witness that was called yes. but some of the background that led to this tragic and horrible death of this beautiful young girl Okay, folks, so we're listening to part of the prosecution's opening statement that was given today. Um, by the way, just before we even get to the substances, uh, Linda, and uh, I'm interested in what you think, um, how do you think the prosecutor was on, on their feet in terms of their confidence in their case and the presentation of the evidence? Um, I always like to, you know, we always look as lawyers as to the style of the lawyer and how they're doing. What did you think? I, th I thought they were great. I mean, I, you know, both sides are pr pretty much equally matched here in the courtroom in terms of their style. I thought they both were very effective. Um, certainly the prosecution has the emotion on their side. This is a young girl killed uh, who was stalked in, in crazy circumstances. Uh, so I, I do think they were effective. Yeah, and I do as well. And I think that the prosecutor did a really good job at explaining the backstory that led up to this event. And we're going to get to that witness number right. one when we talk about that backstory. Um, because your, all the viewers here love to know, like, you know, when we sit there, we're looking at a body of evidence that we have as prosecutors mm -hmm. in the case, and defenses as well. And we're trying to think of a way, like, how do I present this copious amount of data, the, the text messages and electronic data that you get and the evidence that's in the case? And many times you have to make 
critical decisions to cut certain things out because you want to spearhead in. But of That's course, right. motive and background between parties in a relationship is going to be very relevant, especially relevant in a case where you're trying to determine was this shooting a reckless act or was it an intentional act? I thought the prosecutor did a really good job at simply and yet powerfully showing the erratic nature of this defendant prior to the shooting. What do you think? Well, erratic would lead to reckless. That's the problem. However, he stalked her. He actually stalked her. To me, one of the most crucial issues here is this young woman wanted her alarm in her house on. Uh, that's, that is devastating to the defense, if I'm the defense attorney looking at this. Uh, now, it doesn't lessen what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to say this was all reckless because you've got a kid who was just, he couldn't cope with what was going on. He's just almost like the, the husband who comes in on somebody having a, in, an affair with his wife and he just, he couldn't cope and he went, you know, he went through the roof and he got the gun, but he only intended to, to actually scare her. He didn't intend to kill her. So I'm still going to go on with that. But that's a devastating aspect that he was having a fearful effect on her and that she was perceiving it as something more than just oh my ex-boyfriend is, is kind of hounding me right and, and I agree completely and let's not ever lose sight of the fact when you're trying a case in front of a jury it's not even necessarily what you say as Maya Angela would say or what you do it's how you make them feel and if they're sitting there and they're watching all this creepy stalky behavior which goes right. to the charge of stalking in the case right. they're looking at that as more of a pre in my opinion premeditated he was going to get her a attention. She wasn't responding to him. She was in fear, as you point out, the alarm. These little things are really, 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 powerful, really powerful and important. And then in the end, this is what he decides to do in order to finalize it. And then we go to the post-shooting text messages that show after the act conduct, uh, where he's almost flippant about the idea that now you're with God, you know, uh, basically right. tell God right. about the passage. That oh, my gosh. Or whatever. oh, my this gosh. This is not stuff that's going to resonate well emotionally mm. with the jury. No. No, it's not going. It's not going to resonate well. It's not going to take away from the fact that he took responsibility, pled to something uh, that he did was shooting into the house. Um, it, I think it overpowers that, quite frankly. And the only issue here is: does he can get convicted of intentional murder, felony murder, or does the defense make such a great case that he skates and gets convicted of some kind of lesser included charge, such as a, a reckless homicide or a manslaughter, which sentencing wise is a huge win for the defense here. Yes, so I, I, while you guys were all listening to that clip, I'm sure very diligently and, and, and in hopeful anticipation of our return <laughs> yes. back here to, to do it, we were diligently working uh, with one of your colleagues in Tennessee, who's actually a public defender, I believe, right. Dale Potter. Right, he's okay. over in Knoxville. Uh, right. Trying to get an idea, because uh, we're really just curious oh, about what's the sentencing ramifications right. of this thing. Uh, why did the defense lawyer plead guilty to the reckless uh, shooting inside of a house? And uh, we did find out something I thought was really key is that felony murder actually does carry a life sentence, a life without parole sentence, if they were given the proper notification. That's correct. Um, which we, I'm same sure, as intentional murder. Same, same thing. as intentional murder. So we, right. we clarified that. What else did we find out? Later? We also found out that there's a second degree, which is a knowing murder, but without planning, which gives you 15 to 25 years. The judge has some discretion, but that you're going to be have to do 100 percent. And then we found that there's a great discrepancy. It drops all the way down to the manslaughter, which is called what they call a class C felony, which is, as again, a reduced penalty to even a reckless homicide. And this is where the defense is going, which is only and I think it, it actually surprised me two to four years. Now in New Jersey that would never happen. That would never fly in terms of sentencing. But if the defense can prove that this was just a reckless homicide, two to four years is a big difference from life imprisonment. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I mean these are, the, I really would love to know what were the plea negotiations in the case because that's yes. what all these cases come down to. Prior to the jury seeing the case and prior to a trial, most cases plead out. Uh, it, probably 95% of them. The prosecution gives up a little bit. The defense gives up a little bit. Me personally, there wasn't a case in six years in the county that I ran that I ever pled a murder to anything other than murder. It was the one charge I refused to plea bargain away. I would rather lose it in court. Uh, so it, that's a big risk. The difference it's is, is risk. you only indicted things that you thought were murder. Well, okay? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. and, and this prosecution, I'm sure, believes this is murder too. And there's good there's evidence for it. I mean, there's evidence for this. Whether it's beyond a reasonable doubt, I don't know. But there is evidence by the stalking that he intended to kill her. Well, of course, we always would charge people with, with something that we believed it was. But let's be honest, there are cases many times where the defense is bringing out passion provocation, uh, which mm -hmm. applied in many cases, especially domestic violence cases. Uh, and you, you wonder, will a jury 
buy it or not buy it. And it could be very easy to have this feeling. Uh, let me just drop it down a little bit and get rid of the case. It goes away. No appeals. Everybody, you know, gives a little bit. But I, I just was reflexively of the idea that when you take somebody else's life and I believe even if the case is tough to prove, let's go in and try the case again. If we lose the case, we lose it. Right. But here, listen, again, the prosecutor, uh, we got, with everything that we got from, from Dale, right? Right. The, the prosecutor is still holding the Trump card on this felony murder. Absolutely. Um, and I would suspect that that is where the rubber met the road and the breakdown of communications. So anything less of murder or a felony murder, the defense I think we call it wins, the case, wins, if right, you will. Right. Uh, and felony murder or greater than the prosecution is going to win a huge sentence. Sure. I mean, case. if I were representing this kid, I mean, I would imagine, I don't know for a fact, but I imagine there were negotiations also with second degree murder here. Because with a, with a range of 15 to 25 years, this is a young kid. He'd be out in his 40s or his 50s. So I'm sure the defense pushed for that. They probably pushed for reckless and then they pushed for knowing. And the prosecutor wouldn't give because you do have a 16 year old girl's life was taken under terrible circumstances because she was stalked before. Yeah, and you bring up a point that's really important. And many, uh, when I first started trying murder cases back in the day, when I had a full head of hair and a flat belly. Uh, <laughs> you, you still do. <laughs> thank you. Um, you never even, I, I know this sounds crazy, guys. We never even really contacted the victim's family in the resolution of murder cases. Uh, it was a different world back in the day. It wasn't because we were mean spirit or whatever. We were dealing with lots of cases coming in, lots of homicides happening, and we didn't have like a victim witness unit really. We didn't have the victim's crime bill. But since that time, when I became the head prosecutor, we had the victim's crime bill. We had to make sure that we contacted the victims on every case, let them know each stage of the proceeding, which is a good thing to do. Absolutely. Um, and you could be assured that this prosecutor did it, and at a certain point in time said, listen, they're, they're willing to take probably second degree or 15 to 20, whatever the, 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 phrase, right, the phraseology right, right, right. was, are you willing to risk uh, ultimately us going to trial and losing and getting less? And typically my experience in that conversation has been go for it. Now, of course, the victim doesn't make the ultimate decision. The prosecution always does, but they have to take into account Absolutely. now Absolutely. what the victim's family thinks. What do you think about yeah. the change we had in the that. law? We, we actually had that. When I was in Monmouth County prosecutor under Alexander Lair, who's now deceased, uh, we had a victim's witness unit, one of the first in the state at that point. And we always contacted the victim and worked with the victims in many situations. And sometimes the victim did not want to go to trial. And you had to take that into account because maybe they were older, maybe the family was older, maybe they couldn't deal with it. But most situations they did want to go to trial and they did want to just see where the chips fell. Yeah, and, and you know, there's also that other thing, folks, uh, especially when you're working in an urban county like I did when I first started out, that uh, regrettably, I'd say probably 50% of the homicide cases I was first starting to try, uh, we couldn't even identify a family member oh. or the victim. Oh, that's uh, heartbreaking. Yeah, Heart it really it's is. heart wrenching. Yeah, it really yeah. is. So we kind of felt like a sense of responsibility to make sure that we yes. acted in, in that stead for the person in making those decisions. So listen, it's really coming down to what is the, the, the str strategy in this hugely different sentencing dynamic that exists in Tennessee. So let's listen to the clip where the defense is basically saying, hey, we admitted to what this is by pleading guilty, which is a very unusual move for a mm -hmm. lawyer to do prior to a trial. We're going to explain that on the other side of the clip, the nuance and tactics of that, and see whether or not our folks here online, if they have any questions, uh, are convinced that this was a good move or a bad move tactically for the defense to do, because by pleading guilty, They've lost the argument, the defense, down the road to say at the end of the trial, you should find him guilty of the thing he actually pled guilty to yesterday. Um, they kind of gave that away. They kind of gave up that middle ground when you want to argue to the jury, it's this but not that. Uh, so maybe before we get to the clip, what are, you, what are your thoughts well, on Well, that? also, but the jury now knows he's going to spend time in jail for something. They know that. And he, I, I still think the defense did a good job by saying, look, this is what it is. It's reckless. It's reckless. It's reckless. We've been saying it's reckless. It's reckless. It's reckless. Now, now this is what this case is, and we take responsibility. So I still think it's a good issue, and I also think that the jury, knowing that he's getting convicted of something because he pled guilty to it, is also good for the defense. Yeah, getting to a, a, an example of a prosecution case, and one that I tried that was what we call the you know a garbage case, if you will. It was thrown to you when you're a young assistant prosecutor, and somebody <laughs> says, "I don't want to try the case." So Bianchi here, you want to try a case? It wasn't that. that we didn't yes. think the guy did it. The evidence just wasn't good in, in the case. And we had a really bad guy that was out there uh, stabbing people left and right. He wound up going after the wrong guy. A fight ensued in, in 
you know, on the street. Mm -hmm. The knife was going back and forth, to, you know, during the encounter. And the defendant, the person who was ultimately charged, sta got the knife and stabbed the person a couple of times in the middle of this altercation. And they were actually charged with attempted murder, wow. okay, for that in the middle of a, an altercation, which wow. is really a hard charge to prove charge in that scenario. Um, and then the aggravated, the various aggravated assault counts. So folks, you know, what, what I did is convinced that we were going to lose the attempted murder charge was in summation say to the jury something essentially like, look folks, you listen to the evidence and, and there's no question about the fact that you were going to have a very difficult time when you go into that jury room determining whether he purposefully meant to kill the person in the middle of this altercation. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. That's what the evidence shows. That's what you're going to have to take a long time to consider. But with regard to everything else, there's no question he's guilty of that. That was my throwaway charge. Right. Linda uh, Kenny Bodden, do you know within five minutes there was a knock on the door on, on a two-week trial that I thought was very complex? Not, not, trust me, it's not, nothing to do with me. Right. Um, with a guilty verdict of everything, including the attempted because murder. Because you were honest, and, and one of the things you have to have is honesty. And I remember the judge bringing me into chambers afterwards and said, I am extremely concerned about this guy being convicted of attempted murder, which you know is a whopper of, of a sentence versus the aggravated assault charges. Right. And we actually, and this is what I love, loved about being a prosecutor. Um, I actually was able to go to my boss and say, I don't think the right thing happened here in court. I believe they convicted him far wow. in excess of what he should wow. have been convicted of. I made an argument that apparently, you know, it's not like we're making a specious but, argument, but, but, you see, but I didn't think it was right. It to, wasn't to right, but, but interesting enough that honesty from you made the jury go the other way to, to convict because they thought you were so honest. But you being an honest prosecutor said, this is not right, this has to be undone. Right, right. right? And, and that's what we did. And, and that's why when my first office that I worked in as a prosecutor, I loved it because my boss was always about one thing. Bob, what's the right thing to Love do? Love it. That's And the you know what be. I did when I became the head prosecutor? How many times I'd say to them, what's the right thing to do? And Linda, you know as well as I do, in many instances, Sometimes it's not so easy to figure out what the right thing to do is in these cases. Well, well, it's very hard, but that's why, you know, they pay you the big bucks. I'm just kidding. Yeah. They don't pay you any big bucks when you're a prosecutor. Uh, you, have to be, you have to be moral. You have to be ethical. You have to do the right thing. And that's why when I see all these cases, because, you know, people's lives are here. You don't want wrongful convictions either, right? Right. I mean, that's terrible. Imagine going to sleep at night with a wrongful conviction. Usually it means there's a bad guy out there doing something else or a bad woman out there doing something else. But in this situation, that, that ethics, that morality you have, is wonderful. Well, I, well thank you. And, and I think many, uh, I, I think that less prosecutors are thinking this way. I think this is more of an influence of my father, who was a tremendous trial lawyer in his own right. It was always about justice and doing the right thing. Again, it's a very uncomfortable concept. Very. Uh, and I see less and less of that in the mechanistic, what I call criminal claims adjusting world. It's all about moving beans from one jar to the next. But this case is very forward. difficult. This case is very difficult. You have an 18 year old kid, he took this life. But, but what if he, he just intended to scare her? What right. if? What if? And that's where the burden of proof comes in. I mean, he killed her. He should go to jail for killing her. Right. And, and Absolutely. Linda, how many times have we deal? I'd say the most difficult cases we ever dealt with were these reckless manslaughter kinds of cases where the person didn't necessarily intend, usually a young person, didn't mean somebody to intend to die. Let's say the drinking and driving fatality. Right. You know, when I started out, a drinking and dra driving fatality resulted in a probationary sentence, no jail time. By the time I became the county prosecutor, that was a sometimes 10, 15, 20 year yes, sentence. That's correct. And, you know, you understand why you need to do that for a deterrence purposes, but you'd be heartless either as a prosecutor, defense lawyer, or even uh, you folks if you were, you know, had an opportunity to sit in the courtroom to see most of these people who are filled with regret, remorse, and fear, not to just shake your head sometimes and say, wow, what a tragedy all the way around. You have a young woman who lost her life. It's a tragedy. You have two families who are obviously devastated. The family's a tragedy. The criminal justice system is hard. Right. It is hard, and it tears at your heart. Right. I don't think this is going to be the case, though, because I think the prosecutor did a really good job at showing all that creepy behavior beforehand oh, and afterwards, terrible. and that's what's terrible going to separate behavior. this case. So let's go to the defense clip here and see how the defense is going to try to circumvent their way around it. And I'm really interested in your folks' comments that are online about whether you think that this was a good tactical move to plead guilty and open up to the jury this way or not so good a move. Here we go. Okay, a little sidebar there. So we just had the brother, uh, Linda. So we've had mom and the brother. Uh, prosecution uh, put on what we thought was going to be a really banal and boring 
uh, custodian of records, which sometimes you just need to do, but they came out with the Zippy 911 call. There is a lot of impactful emotional mm -hmm. testimony. This prosecutor is laying on heavy right in the beginning of the case to drill the message. I think that's a phenomenal thing to do. What are your thoughts? That's exactly the way you have to go here. And, and the defense has not countered with the theme. They questioned the brother about being on and off the relationship between Emma and Riley. I don't know what that means unless it means that maybe on some of the other off times he didn't attempt to kill her or scare her. I'm not sure, but I think the prosecution, what they've done is much more impactful than the defense. And I think we're going to see dad next. Okay. And so here we got some testimony in court, and I think we're going to throw back to that. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be more powerful testimony if the prosecution's way that they've handled this case so far is anything like what they're going to do going forward. Let's see. Hey, sorry to interrupt in the middle of the testimony, but it's uh, that bewitching hour again, Linda, where unfortunately Sad. we have to sign off. It was great being with you guys. Thank you for all of your questions. Linda, you are an awesome guest. Love you, Bob. A true professional. Love you back. Thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the opportunity to listen to the Law and Crime Network. We're returning to the show. Lise Wheels coming back to host uh, in the next couple of hours. She's awesome, too. Thank you very much, folks.